show a little video that gives a slight overview of the board game. And uh, <clears throat> the images you're seeing in this video um, are not the final images because we're finishing up some final publishing tweaks and we got some final artwork done, which we will show you some of that here in a minute. But I'm just going to show you this video so you can kind of see an overview of how this board game works and what it is that we have developed. And then uh, after we watch the video, um, I'll walk through a little bit of how the board game goes. And then uh, Grant will talk about kind of how we developed it and how we got to this point. And then we'll talk to you guys about where we're moving forward in the future, what kind of help we're looking for, and uh, how we could work together on this with uh, other folks in the Western United States. So um, we'll start with that video. I'm going to pull that up here. And uh, if you can't hear it, um, let me know again. Uh, but we tested it earlier with Steve and it should work. So Today I will show you an overview of Pest Friends, an educational strategy game about pest management for two or more players. The goal of the game is to help players learn more about the way insects and other organisms interact with humans and their crops, and how decisions like spraying pesticides affect their field and the ecology within it. One person will take on the role of the moderator. In general, the moderator does not make in-game decisions, but facilitates the game for the other players by carrying out hidden consequences based on the other player's decisions. The other player or players will take on the role of pest managers working together as a team. They will have to make tough decisions about how to manage insects living in their field using a limited number of actions and money. At the end of the game, the pest manager will score points based on how healthy their final crop is and how much money they have spent. To set up the game, the moderator selects a scenario. Each scenario includes information about the crop being used and what types of organisms may enter the field and how they affect the crop and other organisms. This bag represents the field. For this scenario, the player starts with 20 healthy crop tiles, representing the maximum harvest potential of the field. Over time, these crops may become damaged or even devastated, resulting in yield loss. Throughout the game, insects and other organisms will enter the field and interact with each other and change the composition of the field. This information will be hidden to the players unless they make decisions to investigate. Now let's look at the play area. Here we have an area with a round summary summarizing what happens in each round. And over here we have the month tracker showing us the rounds of the game in which players will have to make decisions between planting and harvest of their crop. This diagram in the corner shows us how end game scoring is calculated based on how healthy the plants are in the field at the end. This area, or the bank, is where players will keep their money which they will use to take certain actions. At the end of the game, this money will be added to their final score if they didn't have to use it. In this scenario, the highest possible score is having $99 at the end of the game. This would mean that players made wise decisions and had all healthy crops at the end. It is also possible for players to get a score of $0 at the end, meaning that their entire crop was devastated and they used up all of their money in management decisions. Now let's look at how each round or month will work in the game. At the beginning of each month, some insects move into the field. Afterwards, the pest managers are ready to decide how to use their time and money. For each month, players may take two actions of their choice. They can do the same action twice if they like. Some actions may have a cost associated with them as indicated in the bottom right corner of the card. Pest managers can also take an additional third action each month, but this requires hiring out extra labor and costs $1 extra to use beyond the normal cost of an action. Here is how the actions work for this scenario. If a player scouts, then they will draw five tokens from the field represented by the bag. They may look at those tokens and use this information to influence their decisions. If a player finds something in their field that they are unfamiliar with, they can research that specimen. By researching a specimen, the players will be given a document detailing information about the organism's biology, how it might affect the field, and management techniques. If players are worried about their lunar wheat taking heavy damage, they can irrigate the crop an extra time, which will help one damaged plant recover and become healthy again. If players would like, they can apply pesticides to their field. The pesticide cards have a label with specific rules and regulations connected to them, and players should always read and follow the label. If the players break a pesticide law, they will be potentially punished in-game. If the players would like to earn some extra money, 
they can carry out the custom farming action which represents you taking your equipment to work in another farmer's field for a period and earning some money for your labor. Players can also take a portion of their lunar wheat and rent it out to another farmer to use for grazing livestock. This sacrifices six crop tiles from your field, but you earn half of what you would at the end of the game, gaining the money immediately. If a player scouts, then chooses to scout again, they can leave the tiles they pulled out already and draw another set of five tiles. If any other action follows scouting, the tiles are returned to the bag immediately. Almost all actions will influence the field and organisms within it. As the players take actions, the moderator will be carrying out the consequences of those actions and keep track of what is happening with insect populations and the field. For example, when a pesticide is used, this may kill some or all insects in a field, and it's the moderator's job to carry out these changes without the player knowing. Each organism in the scenario will have its own qualities and traits. For example, some insects may be sensitive to humidity, so irrigating extra affects their reproduction. Others may be killed when the field is grazed. Some insects can even build up resistance to certain types of pesticides which lose their effectiveness after multiple uses. At the end of each round, the moderator will carry out insect feeding and reproduction by looking at all the tiles in the bag. Some insects will be predators and eat other insects, removing them from the field. Others will feed on the crop, causing damage based on the population. After feeding, all remaining insects will reproduce and increase in numbers in the field based on their individual traits. Each round, insects will colonize the field, players will take actions, and insects will feed and reproduce. Once all rounds are completed, the players will be told what their score is, and the moderator will walk them through what happened over the course of the game. The moderator may also keep track of insect numbers at the end of each round using a spreadsheet system like this to show the players what happened to the populations of each insect over time. And that is how Pest Friends is played. Each scenario will contain different concepts and principles to teach learners about integrated pest management. To learn more about this game, which is still under development, please send an email to jasont at uidaho.edu. Okay, so <clears throat> that video is meant to just give you kind of a general overview of a little bit about what the game is about. Now I'm going to kind of walk you through <clears throat> what's going on in the game. So the game, as you saw there in the video, is focused around this bag. And that bag represents the field because at any time, if we um, had infinite resources and infinite time, we could actually tell exact numbers of all insects and organisms within a field. Now, I know it's not technically possible, but that's what we do in the game is we are tracking all of the organisms in the field and how they are affecting crops and then carrying out consequences of the player's choices and then also reproduction and feeding of those organisms living in the field. So now I'm going to show you a little of this uh, slideshow. We'll go through uh, a little bit about what's happening um, within the scenario itself. <clears throat> and this is just one scenario that we're showing you here. This is built as a system um, in order for you to allow learners to play and experience what pest management is like. Is there anything you wanted to add, Grant, while I pull that up? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> currently, we're working on uh, several different types of pests. Um, this first scenario is looking at an insect pest. Uh, the next, The next scenario that should be published soon is most likely going to be a weed pest, um, but in, in different scenarios, we may be looking at actual uh, diseases or uh, microbial issues and within a livestock production system. So this is hopefully a, a set tool that these different scenarios can come in and out uh, seamlessly as players or learners can come in and learn about these different concepts and different systems. All right, thanks. Um, so here we go. We'll go and see if we can get through this here. So this is kind of the board game cover of the game that we just got the art recently done with. And so I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, some of the art and some of those things. So uh, yeah, Grant's showing it off there for you. So in this scenario, the first scenario of the game, players are managing a crop called lunar wheat. Now this is not a real crop. So we decided to create a fictitious scenario where there are insects feeding on a crop that does not really exist. 
so that they are trying to learn and experience the principles of integrated pest management. We don't want them to have any specific advantage when they come into the game. So they're going into unfamiliar territory, working in this fictitious crop called lunar wheat. And over time, this crop is going to change in terms of damage. You can see there's a, a couple different uh, little crop um, tiles showing there of a nice, clean, uh, green, uh, fresh, um, healthy crop, and then a damaged crop, and then a devastated crop. So over time, their crop might be taking damage. And as they're scouting, they'll be able to figure that out. While they're also scouting, they're going to start discovering different insects in their field. Now, these insects are, again, semi-fictitious, um, but I'll talk to you about what each one kind of represents in reality. So we've got this bug here, this one here, and then this one here. These bugs are going to be moving in and out, colonizing the field, feeding, feeding on each other, and causing damage within the field itself. Um, so the first insect is this one here. Within this scenario, these basically behave like aphids, but we don't want to give that away to anybody. We want them to have to learn and experience what it's like finding something new and uh, scouting and researching because um, the folks who are playing this, it might be a middle school youth who's playing it, or it could be a seasoned farmer. We want that. We want to see how they react when they find something new. Do they just instantly want to kill it and spray it, or do they try to research it and learn about it um, in order to uh, make the best management decisions? So um, in this scenario, the aphids or the fan bugs is what they actually are. The fan bugs behave like aphids. They reproduce very quickly, and they are also... Uh, almost constantly colonizing the field. Now, I know that's not true of every single aphid species, but um, there are some that are quite mobile and they're moving you know, throughout the season. So they do that. And then they're also, to demonstrate some of the um, properties of insect biology, uh, these fan bugs are susceptible to high amounts of moisture and they will actually, um, if you do custom farming as an action, if the players do that, they can accidentally bring them into their field and then different pesticides will affect the fan bugs, this species, different than others. Another one that's in the game is this uh, bog beetle is what we call them. And they are very similar in behavior to a ladybug. They're going to feed on the aphids or the fan bugs. And uh, they can help you have some control in your field and have some assistance through biological control. And so they'll be coming into the field. And if players make poor decisions by using a very... Uh, generalized pesticide that's not uh, non-selective, non -selective, they're going to uh, kill off their predators and they're going to have more problems in their field. So uh, there can be non-target effects based on the player's decision. So again, everything, uh, these populations are changing and shifting and all these tiles imagine are in that bag or behind that screen where the moderator or the teacher of the class is uh, um, keeping track of what's happening with these bug populations. Um, and everything uh, that's happening behind there is eventually going to be placed into an application or a program to do it for you. But for now, um, we have to use human computers, which do their best. Um, another bug that is in the game is this one here, which we like to call the Carillion Crawler, or basically just the blue bugs is what people call them. And they represent um, a bug that is benign to the crop. Now, this is a tarnished plant bug. They're not always benign, but in many crops they are. They don't cause a lot of damage. They're more of a secondary pest. And so within the game, these insects behave in a manner that they will cause some damage to some degree, but only if there's major pest problems do they actually contribute to the cause, to the, you know, to the problems. Most of the time they're under control and they're not going to be a problem um, for the players. This is just, again, like we showed some of the actions the players will be taking within this scenario. They're going to be scouting and researching new bugs as they find them. They can do custom farming. They can graze the ground. They can irrigate. They can use different pesticides. And again, doing that custom farming might accidentally bring some other insects in. As they're taking their tractor to work in someone else's field, they might be bringing more insects into their own field and causing uh, problems. Um, in this scenario, that's what happens. Um, if they graze it, they can kill some of the bugs. If they irrigate it, they can kind of slow down those uh, fan bug populations, the ones that are like the aphids. That may not be true of all aphids, but again, we're just trying to help them think about these things um, and that some of these things will have an effect, uh, you know, modifying the habitat uh, and all the variety of things that could affect pest populations. And then uh, the two pesticides you see here, the way we made it um, 
was so that uh, this first one, exterminate, and again, these are fictitious pesticides. The exterminate would behave similarly to a pyrethroid. It's going to kill a lot of things, and there is uh, quite a bit of uh, resistance to it. So in the game, that uh, bugs can have resistance to it, and it does kill a lot of things. It's not very selective. Whereas the torque two, it would represent a more uh, selective pesticide that is going to kill only a specific type of insect. So it's much more expensive. So we're letting players experience that tough decision making of, okay, a cheap pesticide versus an expensive one, which one are you going to purchase? Well, if you're going to purchase the cheap one, you're going to lose your predators. And so you're going to have to use a lot more other things and deal with the problems you're going to create with that. So now I'm just going to show you um, some of the players that have uh, played through the game and uh, what's happened with them. I'll actually let Grant go through these with you, and I'll just keep uh, moving the slides along for him. So yeah, Grant. gladly. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, the the names of these people have been prote uh, changed to protect the innocent. Um, uh, this first player that we're going to share with you is a small farmer. Uh, you know, professed that they were. Um, comfortable using pesticides, uh, didn't want to spend a whole lot on pesticides, um, didn't really want to scout their field, uh, the, the, the bag, the field, uh, with the concept of, I know I've got a problem, I don't want to check under the hood, I'll just drive it into the ground and see what happens. And then uh, with our research documents, they, they quickly skimmed through uh, the documents. As a friend of mine, maybe they just wanted to get to lunch with me or something. I don't know, but it was, this is their experience here. Uh, they scouted and uh, did some research. Um, as you can see, there's the 20 healthy uh, tiles representing the healthy crop tiles. And then there's, uh, we've got that gold or yellow bug in there. That's the fan bug. And then the pink one, that's the bog beetle. And then the blue one is the cerulean crawler. Uh, next slide, Jason. Uh, in this next round, they uh, did some more scouting. Uh, they researched uh, two of the insects. So at this point, they had discovered all three of the insects in this scenario. And they had all the information that we provide to the player available to make the decision they want to, uh, managing the, the pest, uh, how they'd like to, managing their beneficials, how they'd like to. Um, and and all of these scenarios start the same for every player. We don't randomize uh, what insects go into it based on uh, how we feel. The scenarios are built based on equations, the, the dynamic of how they reproduce or what actions are taken have effect on the insects. That is all set into equations on how this game moves through moves through from round to round show them yeah. those yeah i've got I forgot uh, to explain that so, so these are uh not final but these are our colonization um see if i can get that to focus these are colonization cards um and they represent a round or a month in which uh insects will come and uh, colonize in the field that the player is uh is managing for pests and these are set. These are these are the same every time a player plays it. It's set. At least for um, based on the scenario. Based so. on the scenarios. So this is scenario one with with a lunar wheat with specific pest and beneficial and neutral insects in this scenario. Again, we briefly mentioned earlier that we're developing more scenarios. Uh, you can go to the next slide. There, perfect. Uh, so this player decided to use a pesticide. They used, I believe, exterminate. Yep, exterminate. And as you can see from the last slide, they lost their beneficial, which is that pink insect. And they didn't quite actually really eradicate all of their pest, which is the aphid-like fan bug. And then after they sprayed this pesticide, they scout it again. And, and just a reminder, they get to see five tiles out of the entire bag uh, when they do a scouting. Uh, then they realized, hey, I just spent some money. I want to get that money back. And so they went and custom farmed. And um, the idea that we're trying to teach with custom farming is that you have taken equipment, whatever that piece of equipment is, and you've, you've loaded it up or you've gone to your neighbors and you've used an implement in a neighbor's property or farm, and you come back to your property, and potentially you had some hitchhikers, which could be pests. 
And in this instance, uh, they did custom farming twice, which results in bringing more of these pests, the fan bug, back to your own, your own farm, which their population, when it grows large enough, it will cause the issue of damaging your crop. So you can see here that, um, sorry, Jason just handed this to me. This is the, the mock extension publication that we uh, provide to our learners, our players, as they research insects. And so all the information I elaborately told just now about insects coming is, is defined in this actual mock pub, pub, pub sorry, <laughs> publication. Uh, well, and and that's what I was going to say with the publication is they're not taking a shot in the dark because they will be read if they read the publications about these fictitious bugs, they will learn how they can manipulate the habitat by irrigating more and avoiding custom farming and which pesticides to use. If they read that research properly and use that skill, um, then they're going to be more effective and make better decisions. So we're teaching them that skill. They're getting to practice. Um, practice that so. yeah rather than making the mistake or the learning lesson in real life this is a hypothetical scenario um, again back on this slide so they brought in more more of this pest the population grew and so they started seeing some damage in their actual crop production yep. uh, the the dynamic for uh, the breeding of this insect is that they exponentially grow. They double every round. And so any left from the previous round, you're going to have double that amount into the next round. And so these things just exploded, especially where they custom farmed again and brought in more of this pest into their field. Um, after the fact, they were, did a little bit of scouting. Um, I think on this one, I tried to help him out, he or she. Um, I tried to help him out and say, hey, uh, look, take a look at the publication. I think it said in there, if you go ahead and do some irrigating, it might help your problem. Uh, it helped a little bit, and they're kind of far lost uh, with their growing population. Uh, they went ahead and opted to use exterminate. Again, we talked about this pest becomes resistant every time you use it. And so the efficacy of this pesticide was reduced with this second application. Um, again, that's the principle of using different uh, you know, chemical groups uh, chemistries. And, and chemistries to uh, get appropriate um, efficacy from your application. Um, and then they went ahead and scouted to discover they had a really big problem. Uh, they scouted again. Uh, they thought, oh man, I got to try to save this. They irrigated. I can't remember. I think that broke a pesticide law because they irrigated immediately. I can't remember if they did or not. But anyways, that's kind of, that's a dynamic built into the game. If you uh, accidentally break a pesticide law uh, for the state of Idaho, we, we say ISDA has received a phone call and you have either a lawsuit or you lose your license or something like that and the player can no longer take any pesticide actions if that, if that is the case. Um, as you can see here, a growing pest population, uh, they're nearing kind of the end of the, the game here with round seven. Uh, they went ahead and grazed to cut their losses. So that took uh, a big portion of the pest out of the field and they got immediate gains uh, from the crop tiles that were sacrificed. And it probably was the best management decision they could do at that time based on the heavy losses they posed to, to get uh, from the pest uh, that was just growing uncontrollably. Uh, in their field. Yeah, and it, it says in the research that um, with this pest, if you graze um, the lunar wheat, it will kill a lot of them. So that that's something they find in the research. So it's a good um, thing they can do as a last ditch effort. But here you can see. Yeah, this is this is looking over time, their rounds, their score, uh, the, the pest population, the beneficial population and the neutral insect population. Uh, and their final score was 66. Uh, I think, what is that? Is that a, is that a D? So it'd be kind of failing, I guess, I guess if you look at it as, as a test score, but it's a learning, it's a learning principle of like, wow, you did really poorly because of these things. And, and after all of these players play the game with a facilitator, either us or, um, you know, other locations that are using our, our game right now, uh, Texas A&M, College of Southern Idaho, 
um, some high schools are using it as well. Uh, the facilitator has an opportunity to break down the experience, either the, the player as an individual or if they played it as a team, uh, the experience they had and what are some important takeaways. And it's just, I mean, it's pretty great to talk about like, this is why you're, you, you're not a good farmer, but you're actually a farmer. <laughs> um, and just talk about those things because it, it's not real, but the principles are real. Uh, so yeah, th sorry, Jason's got the next one pulled up. This is uh, what we call the informed organic uh, producer. Uh, they felt morally obligated to not use pesticides. And um, they said they were pretty comfortable with the principles of uh, IPM in a general sense. Again, same start scenario. Uh, they scouted, uh, did some research, uh, scouted, and then did some custom farming. Things were looking good. And that's the fun thing with scouting is sometimes players will get a what we call a bad pull. That means they pulled five healthy tiles from the bag, and that's the randomness of this game. Um, trying to mimic the random randomness you may or may not may or may not see with uh, actually scouting a field with a net. You may not catch everything, uh, or you may not catch anything going 75 miles an hour down the road to you know and call that scouting. Um, and so. This player did not see any issues and said, well, things are well, I'm going to go make some money. And they did some custom farming, brought in some other pest, scouted again. They, um, they'd, they'd remembered that, hey, there's a thing here that says it'll help reduce populations of this pest if I irrigate. And so they irrigated earlier on in the game, and that has the most benefit in the game. Again, the pest population is kind of un in unchecked. Um, it's growing pretty, pretty uh, strong. Um, they scouted that and then I think they discovered maybe the beneficial or neutral at this point and they researched that insect. Uh, here they scouted twice and they discovered there's an issue and so they went ahead and opted into grazing. Uh, so they they got some immediate gains on their, their crop production um, right then and there and sacrificed some of that early on, but it mitigated the, the risk that was posed there by the pest in the field. Uh, here they've got uh, some, they scouted and then they discovered the third and final bug with the research. Uh, normally uh, players discover the bugs pretty quickly and are able to research all three of the insects early on in the game. So they have all the information as they play out. This is unique in the sense that they didn't discover that information towards the end of the game. Uh, scouted twice here and then irrigated uh, to try to bring back some of their crop back to life. Again, this is fictitious and a, a game gameplay interaction may not be exactly accurate of um, how plants do interact in a crop cropping system, but for the sake of the game, that has a, has a really good benefit to the gameplay aspect. Again, here, they uh, I think at this point, we're like, I'm gonna ride it out. I'm not gonna spray anything. I just wanna scout a little bit and see what happens. Um, and this is their uh, end score. They did 60, they, uh, their score was 60. Again, maybe not a uh, passing grade, but the concepts that we were able to talk about in the debrief session after gameplay are really beneficial. Uh, as you can see, they actually had a growing population of all of their insects over time. And the hard thing is over this growing season, the beneficial insects do catch up eventually with the pest, but it takes a, a little bit of a lag time at the beginning of the growing season to catch up with that pest. And the last, the last, uh, the player experience that we're going to talk about today here is the gamer. So this is not necessarily someone with any kind of agricultural background. Uh, they enjoy gaming as a hobby. They play lots of board games. Uh, no real experience with pest manager outside of they see a bug, they smack it um, at the home. Uh, again, uh, some scout and research, very, the same as all of our players uh, start out with scenario one. Uh, then next round they had uh, so they did some scouting uh, research and they saw in the research hey some irrigation might be a good thing they went ahead and irrigated and this is one of our first uh, players that really experienced hey 
maybe I should do something early on, do some management practice right now. Um, and it could, yeah, I could really tell with this player that they really um, wanted to do well at this game and weren't treating it like necessarily real life, but learning from the information they got within this game. And they saw that as a management tool that they could do in this game to get ahead. Again, scouted and did not research any of the other bugs and went ahead and irrigated again. Uh, and they got pretty good control from the irrigation they did early on in the production year uh, of their pest, the, the fan bug. And at that point, they just scouted twice and discovered they had a lot of other bugs, but maybe weren't worried about it. Um, scouted twice again and said, well, maybe I should look at what these bugs are. And I think they discovered the, the beneficial, which is that pink insect uh, at this point in the game. Uh, again, here they scouted and scouted twice. Uh, I can't remember exactly what they pulled, but I think they pulled mostly healthy tiles and they thought, man, things are going well and let's just ride it out. Uh, next round, same thing, scouted twice. As you can see, their, their beneficial population starts to go smaller over time. Uh, this is because as the beneficials don't really have a food source, we design the game so that they, they disappear over time. Uh, here at the last round, uh, they scouted and saw all healthy, but as a safety measure, irrigated again and ended the, ended the game with a score of 92. And I will note they didn't use a pesticide. So we tried to uh, build this game so that if you're not, if you have a personal desire to not use pesticides for the gameplay aspect, you can score really well in this game. Or if you're okay and comfortable with using the pesticide, you also can score really well as well. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. So um, kind of the way the game works is, uh, like we said, you have a player playing the game, but when we do this with class, class excuse me, <clears throat> class settings, you play as a team. So all the players are making decisions together. So there's like a captain and they're all making their decisions of what actions they're going to take, how they're going to spend their money. And then they go through the growing um, season. So I think with that, I'm going to share just a few more slides. We're just about wrapped up so we can do some questions. And uh, we'll just briefly talk about kind of how we developed this and then where we're wanting to um, go in the future. So let me share this one here. And the screen tab. Okay, that should be showing the presentation there. There we go. Okay, so how, what was the purpose of this? Why did we make this? The, the reason we made this board game or we did all this is we wanted to take all the complexities of integrated pest management and put it into a game where people could experience consequences and feel what it's like to do pest management. So that includes scouting, research, um, you know, studying that research, learning from it, um, pesticides, uh, predators and biological control, habitat manipulation, then also money, because that's a, a very important part that motivates decisions is money, is how much money can I make? And is this economical? And we focused on that mostly because that's what's going to motivate farmers. And then so taking all those concepts and then making it into a game was kind of our focus. And one thing I will just say about me and Grant is I'm kind of the dreamer. So I'm the guy who comes up with all the crazy ideas and has created a lot of this, but Grant is more of the realist and has helped me to make it more simple and more understandable and more realistic to some degree. Um, so I, I crush his dreams as well. Yep, yep, I'm the dreamer. <laughs> He's the dream crusher. So these are just kind of some of the components. You already saw videos of that, but some of the things that you get with the game. Um, and then as the person running the game, you have different sheets that you will look to and review that will help you to run the back end of the game. Because again, you're doing stuff behind a screen. You are literally the field and everything alive in the field. You are tracking that and you're helping make that happen. It's not like you're making decisions or trying to sabotage the player. You're just carrying out very simple things like, hey, for every ladybug, you kill two aphids at the end of the round. Um, obviously, we used fictitious names um, just for various reasons, but um, this is some of the stuff that you'll be using. 
We're also working on some other scenarios. We're especially working on a weed scenario. We're gonna work with some vertebrate pests is one that we want to do. And then we also really want to do a specialty commodity one because um, everything in the game will change when you change what the crop is and what the value of it is. And the threshold and, that and, comes yep. along with that. And the threshold and all that. Um, so I think with that, um, let me see here. So the biggest thing we're looking for, if you are interested in this board game and you think it'd be a good, helpful tool for you, um, we have a Western SARE grant. Now I know all the folks with the Western IPM Center may or may not be in the Western SARE region. You'd have to reach out to us so we can check for sure. But we have a Western SARE grant to take this board game. We're going to be printing. Um, we're going to be printing a lot of copies of it. Um, I'll put this in the chat as well. Our email addresses. You can look at that real quick there. But anyways, we have a grant to publish hundreds of copies of this game and then take it out and teach people how to use it and uh, how to go through it. And um, I forgot to include the survey data in here, but um, we have done surveys with those that have played the game with over 50 individuals and 100% of them indicated that uh, it, was more it was more engaging to play the game than to sit and listen to a PowerPoint presentation. And we've even had uh, approval with, from the state of Idaho Department of Agriculture to have people play this game as a session. So you can actually earn pesticide credits by playing this game and it has been peer reviewed and it'll be finished through that process by the time we are done. Um, so it's just a definitely a, a different alternative way to um, learn about insects. And I think we also had, was it about 80, what percentage said they felt they learned more this way? Was it uh, above 80% of our like respondents? Is above um, indicated that they learned more this way. And that makes sense because, you know, if you look at uh, psychological studies and education studies, having your learner do things versus just sitting and listening, you're going to have more engagement and more learning and more changes in behavior because um, they're actually engaging with it. So I think with that, we'll take any questions that you have. I'm going to put my email in the chat. And again, uh, we'd love to learn more about ways we can or even um, pest friends you have that email as well yeah or pest friends at uidaho.edu that works too but i'm going to plug that in the chat so if you have any questions um we'll take those now matt's got a question in the chat did players play more than once and did they improve over time I'll let you answer that if you want, Grant. Yeah, uh, players have played more than once. And what we have found is that they, they basically have learned how to operate the game. If they have a mem little bit of memory of like, oh yeah, this is what this bug is as they discover it, I need to do this. And it almost like, it probably isn't as fun, to be honest, uh, the second, ta sec a second time through the same scenario. That's why we're developing multiple scenarios. Mm -hmm. It's more of a one-time learning experience uh, for players. As I was play, play testing this with a middle school class in, in my local area, um, it was great. You know, I came through and we played it, um, you know, immediate discussion of like, why is agriculture matter? Why do pesticides matter? What are these things? I, I'm not a farmer. Why do I care? And those were, those are the things that we're really looking for as far as with youth uh, to open up those conversations. Um, and, and then as I came back and played it again with them, they remembered the conversations we had and how to improve their, their, uh, methods for managing pests and, and 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 such so yeah we we saw improvement but enough improvement that's like oh we got to come up with something different when we come again to to, to these learners because uh, they through this game and then the debrief they really master the idea and it's not as fun to them and so that's a great question and mm -hmm. you know I, we we kind of looked at two ways we've we've looked at okay you go through the season and then you have the same crop again and you go through a second season and then we add more variables. Okay, not only do you have insects, but now you have weeds you have to manage. So you learn the concept of how to manage this insect. Now let's 
bus up the ante is coming more to a reality of IPM of like you've got these multiple variables that you have to manage. And so that's what we're looking at as far as continued scenarios. Uh, it looks like, uh, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, Stefan or Stefan, um, you asked how many participants max. It all depends on what kind of an experience you are going to be doing. So typically we do this with up to about 20 students. I'd say that's the sweet spot. That, that's, that's about the max. Now, I think it's a better experience with about seven or eight players because the struggle you're going to have when you have a bigger group making management decisions is trying to keep everyone engaged because most people will be engaged, but you might have people trying to sit back in a corner and not participate yeah. because everybody is being given these research sheets and everybody's helping to make the decision. There's usually a captain and they're supposed to listen to everybody and everybody's reading the research, but the more players you have, the more likely somebody will read at least part of the research and then start discussing it because we have these discussions between players they're like hey i think we need to use the cheaper pesticide which would be like a pyrethroid or just a non non uh, non-specific just you know nuke the field let's use this one it's just three dollars and then other people are like no no it's eight dollars for this one but we keep our beneficials alive we keep the predators alive we got to do this so you start having these arguments and then uh, with one of my groups, they they sided with the person that said it was cheaper because I guess that person kind of had more influence. They're but, louder, popular. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. but anyways, like <laughs> yeah. then when we when we went back, we could have that discussion of like, okay, you guys chose to go against the research. This is the risk you took, and then this is what happened and the consequences. You can see what happened by your final score and based on what we were seeing behind the screen. But about twenty is where it's at with the physical board game, but. Part of our grant, we are developing an app version where you could play it on your phone. So you could have 50, 100 people playing it all by themselves on their phone. And then you as an instructor could pull um, their scores and you could pull up anybody's playthrough and say, hey, let's look how Timmy did. He played and uh, he made these choices. Let's see how he did. And you walk through just like we did with our PowerPoint. You show the population how it fluctuates and changes over time based on their decisions, then you can compare and have those discussions. But there's a lot of value um, either way with it. But um, yeah, that's kind of where we're thinking in terms of uh, max players. Um, and, and then when, when you um, have, let's say, 15 people or so playing, what's the minimum time that I, I would have to give for that game to unfold with like 15 players? I would say about one hour and a half. Grant can talk about his experience with doing it in a public school. I think he did it in two sessions. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. so with the public school, uh, their, their class period time was 45 minutes and I took two 45 minute class periods with that public school. So you need some time to, um, you know, kind of teach them and introduce them to the concept. Um, and then play through it. But I would say about an hour and a half um, should be at most if you're familiar with the game. And so being a facilitator, that's part of what we're going to do with our training is go out to some of these Western United States and train the trainer type thing of, hey, this is how you run the game behind the screen. This is how you be a good facilitator. And then as part of this training, we'll be bringing copies of the game uh, to these folks that attend the training. We will have... Um, somewhat of a charge, but it's going to be cheaper than what the board games cost for us to make. It might be $50 for a, for a workshop for a half day or a full day workshop where we teach them and train them how to do this. And then they get a copy of the game out of it and they can start using it and, uh, you know, taking all that and running with it. That's kind of the hope that we, that we have and what we're trying to do um, with the grant. Anything else you want to add? No. Yeah. If you're, if you're interested in coming to one of these training events or, if you're in a, in a state that is listed within the confines of Western SARE, uh, we really are very interested in talking to you about setting up a way that we can come and, and provide this training. Um, again, like Jason said, we, we'd have some, some sort of a registration cost that we'd have to charge, but the goal of this IPM is to help with those travel needs and getting us to, to different places in the Western United States. Yep. Um, it looks like there's a question from David. He says, sorry, I'm multitasking. Um, can you share again when, about when you expect to release the game? Um, you can, do you want to grab one of the sealed ones over there? Yeah. I have, yeah. uh, there is a, 
there's a first edition um, copy of just some early editions that we made. And uh, we have some of those that are available right now. Um, we're selling them for, I believe we've been selling them for like 80 bucks or something. But if you can wait until we get uh, all the copies printed, so Grant's got them over there. I'll just switch the camera over there. Yeah, again. there's yeah. As you can see, we've gone through several prototypes, um, trying to come out with what we felt like was the best uh, end product um, for the audience of this board game. Um, but yeah, we definitely this is sealed. This is this is one that's uh, the available. Yeah. We we can send it to you. It's not our final uh, peer reviewed version, but um, it is available as a learning tool. Um, and and once we get this as far as like a finished finished it's got the stamp of peer reviewed uh publishing on it that's probably going to be december is what i'm thinking is the reality I'm, on that um, i'm i'm thinking it's going to be closer to maybe even in the spring yeah uh, february march, march yeah. is what i'm hoping we're, fingers crossed for december but yeah but the main thing we're going to do with those copies of the game is we're going to have those to go and take to trainings and then give to those that are learning how to how to run it because the, the we don't want to just send this out to you and have you feel like you can't do it or you're not able to run it because it's not a cakewalk to run the stuff behind the screen because basically you're tracking populations you're feeding predators you're you're having helping these insects to breed because you're you're basically controlling the population dynamics now once the application is ready that will help you uh, then it's going to be a piece of cake and it'll be really easy to run the game. But we want to help people be able to use it and feel like they can make it work with it. So the short answer is there are some available right now. You can email us to learn more or if you can be patient, then uh, for an affordable price, we will train you and we will give you a copy if you're in the Western region. If you're in another region, we could talk about something. If you have some additional funding or something, we could potentially bring it to you and do some trainings um but just email us so we can find out what you're trying to do and what you'd like to do so um yeah we're happy to work with you on i'll let on grant answers. answer this uh ron uh, silvius asked could you expand on who do you expect your audience to be is it growers so yes um <laughs> uh so in our play testing phase, uh, we took it to individuals within the medical industry. We took it to individuals within education industry. Um, you know, just wh whoever we could uh, get to play test for it uh, for us. That's who we took it to, and they all enjoyed it. But the specific goal is uh, young learners, so approximately age twelve and older is probably the most targeted demographic. But we also have taken it to industry groups, uh, a company by the name of Syngenta. Uh, we've used it uh, with, with some of their sustainable team, their inter international sustainable team. Uh, they've taken it and now they're uh, we're going through it with agronomists within their, their company, uh, kind of their field reps. Um, I, you know, they kind of get teased a little bit. They're going to go play a game, but the concepts and the conversation is so vital and it's a fun way. It's just alternative and fun. Um, so yes, all of the above, all of the above, like, like Jason said, we took it to a conference in which it was approved for a recertification of pesticide applicator credits uh, for those holding an applicator license within the state of Idaho. Uh, they were a little bit of a captive audience for sure, but uh, you know, it, it still was very important for them to, you know, relearn or refresh their memory of these important concepts of IPM. Yeah, I guess the, the reason why I'm asking is because based on the explanation that you provided today, it kind of sounded a bit difficult for any kids to understand the game. I think it's very appropriate for extension or for growers, as you mentioned. Uh, but I, I'm, I was just asking, thinking that maybe there is an easier less complicated version for K to 12, while the one you presented oh, sure. seems to be more suitable for an, you know, older yeah. or people with more background audience. Yeah, middle, right now, the way that it is built is for middle schoolers and up. We've done yeah. it with middle schoolers. It just takes a little extra facilitation, but we are working on a kid's version where instead of having like research sheets, there might be like a comic book just showing hey, this bug eats this bug. And so they're just looking at drawings and diagrams yep. of things so they can learn the biology without actually having to read because there is some reading intensity 
um that's yep. that's part of that but yeah that's definitely something we are thinking about and very uh, valid point yeah thank yeah. you um, Steve had a couple questions. It says, will the additional scenarios be add-on modules to the basic game? Yes. So basically this basic game um, with the additional scenarios, there'll be an expansion or something. And if you are basically the way we want to do this is if you end up getting this game and you're running it and you're using it, because once the app is up and running, it will log data for you and say, Steve has been running this with this many people or whatever. And we if, if we see that you're using it, we're probably just going to give you a copy of the expansion and say, hey, Steve, you're using it. Here's three new expansions Keep that, that we've added to the app, and we'll just send you the expansion tiles or whatever else we add into the game. Um, if you're, if you're going to be using it, we're going to be trying to help you. Because, again, the whole purpose of this is not just not like to make money or anything. It's to have a different way to approach IPM education that's engaging and fun. And um, and. And even though um, this will, I think, work great with youth as we modify it, you'd be surprised, uh, surprised, Sylvia. We played this with 70-year-old farmers, and they were very hesitant at first, but by the end, they were very engaged, helping make the decisions. And uh, as they were surveyed, they said this was more engaging and more interesting. It wasn't too complicated for them because, again, they're not, they're not making that many difficult decisions. They're just picking one of eight actions. Okay, am I going to scout? Am I going to research? Am I going to use a pesticide? What am I doing? Um, the facilitator, facilitator does the hard work. Is, yeah, is, what's happening the, behind the, the screen is the hard part. What yeah. the players are doing is very simple. It's just make a decision and then the consequences carry themselves out through what we're doing. Um, Steve also asked if there was any estimated time of arrival on the app. Um, well, there's two, there's two apps we're developing. We are developing a, uh, helper app for the moderator. So for the person running the game, there will be an app. It'll actually be a program ran through the web. So you just go to the web page and then you just start doing it rather than downloading an app. Um, that should be done, um, by December, January or something. That's, that's, that's an app to help the facilitator. Now, for the actual application where the players are playing everything on the phone and you do everything on your phone or on your tablet, whatever you're using, right? That is probably not going to be done um, until later next year, mid next year or something. And once we get to that point, you won't even need to buy a physical copy of the game if that's what you want to do. But there's also a value if you're doing a lab or something to have um, a discussion style thing where you're playing with the game and the physical components. Um, and for smaller groups, that definitely would be much more recommended because you get some really good um, discussions about pest management and why people are making different decisions. So hopefully that answered your question, Steve. I don't know if yes, others have yeah. questions. Yeah. I think we got through most all of them. So yeah. Any other any other questions before we bump up against the end of the hour? Chime in or chat now. Gentlemen, that was excellent, and I can't wait to play it. looks uh, It looks fun, so we will uh, get this posted, and awesome. I will Thanks, yeah. tell you what the next IPM hour topic is going to be in the October. Except we don't have one yet. Um, if you've got research you haven't presented anywhere and would like to practice it, um, this would be a good opportunity. I'm still looking for a presenter for October. Jason Grant, fantastic job. Really appreciate it, and. Uh, you're very Thanks. welcome. Thank you.